that you have joined us again as we worship the Lord this evening. Those who are joining us on live stream, welcome. Let's stand and let's sing that chorus. I just keep trusting my Lord. service this evening. Continue to bless us as we sing and lift up our voices in praise to you. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
president great to know that no matter what situation we're dealing with, good or bad, we can always run to the Lord, and He's always there waiting for us with open arms. Let's stand and let's sing hymn number 59. I will praise Him. When I saw the cleansing fountain, open wide for all my sin.
Well, let's look in the Bible tonight and Luke chapter 19. Look in Luke chapter 19. It's a case to get wild, but I won't trip over that. <laughs> Acts chapter, I mean Luke chapter 19, we'll consider seeking souls. Well, you see here in this chapter a conversation between Zacchaeus and Jesus Christ. And I think there's some things we can learn by his interaction with the Lord and, and what the outcome was. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 1, And Jesus entered and uh, passed through Jericho. <clears throat> and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he is gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, I, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight to be able to take some time and study the scriptures. I pray we might be able to learn from Zacchaeus this evening and uh, just thinking about his relationship and conversation that he has with Christ. And may we gain the heart of God, uh, really the desire of the Savior, to seek and to save that which is lost. And so I pray, Lord, if anyone is with us tonight or watching on the live stream that's not sure they're saved, I pray that the Spirit of God will touch them and impress upon them their need to turn to Jesus Christ. And bless the preaching of the Word of God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text verse is verse 10. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so our text verse identifies really the heart and the mission of Jesus Christ coming into this world. He came into the world because God's not willing that any should perish. Uh, he provided a way of redemption because he will offer himself as a sacrifice on Calvary so that he could take on the sins of all the world, be able to cleanse us, forgive us, deliver us, set us free, and give us a hope of eternal life. And so, uh, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And just as a thought, a means of introduction, I want us to consider Zacchaeus and his conversation, his encounter with Jesus Christ. And uh, notice, first of all, we see the reason for his coming. In verse 3, it says, And he sought to see Jesus, whom he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And so here is this man who is a publican, uh, who is a very wealthy man, a uh, man really that people have identified and acknowledged that he's a publican, he's a wealthy man, got his wealth by uh, corruptible ways, and they really do not like him, but here he is coming to meet with Jesus Christ. Now I see, first of all, the reason for his coming was a physical observation because it says here that he sought to see Jesus. So he wanted to be able to visually see who this Jesus was. No doubt he had heard many uh, comments about who Christ was and what Jesus was doing. And now he hears he's coming through his town and he wants to be able to see who the, this Jesus Christ is. Oftentimes people will throng stadiums and all kinds of different things to try to just see somebody and uh, I, I remember when I was in the Marine Corps, when wow. President Nixon, yeah, John, Tom would get all excited back there, but uh, uh, President Nixon was being inaugurated, and I remember uh, they had all of us that were on duty in D.C. I worked at the headquarters Marine Corps Communications Center, 
And so they had us stand guard duty along the road as the motorcade came by for the inauguration of uh, Nixon to be president. And uh, I just remember all the people thronging there, just crowds of people. And we had to stand out there. It was freezing cold. I thought this is the most idiotic thing I've ever done in my life, <laughs> standing out here freezing to death. I have all the big heavy coat on and everything else. and dress shoes my feet are freezing but anyway i better get off of that but anyway I, uh, I'm, what am i saying i'm saying there's a lot of people that will just do a lot of things to get into a place where they can see somebody that's important or significant or see some event that is taking place then we think why did zacchaeus uh, come to this point of uh, pursuing christ he just wanted to have a physical sight of who Jesus was. He heard so much about him, and he was aware of what was going on, so he went to see Jesus. It, you know, it'd be great if we could live our life as a Christian in such a way it would cause a desire and people want to see what God is and what he does in our life and who he is. And so he created an interest wanting to be able to see a physical observation. But I see also the reason for his coming to where Jesus was is for an intellectual consideration. It says he sought to see Jesus, that's a physical, who he was. That's intellectual. He wants to know who this Jesus Christ is. And the greatest thing I think we can do in helping people to come to Christ is to create a hunger and thirst and longing in them to want to know who is this Jesus Christ. Who is this man of Galilee? Who is this person that you claim has changed your life and he's made such a difference in your life? I, I, got, I need to come to know who this person is. And uh, I found that, that this, I'm finding this, that the, the longer Christ delays his coming, I see a less interest intellectually for people to want to know who God is. And years ago, we used to be able to lead people to Christ. You meet somebody, you share your faith with them, tell them how to be saved, they get saved. Now you got to meet with people, you got to talk with people, you got to share with them who Christ is. And so, Zach, key is why people are, are intellectually wanting to know, they want to understand why. Because this is the age of information. I mean, everywhere you turn, there's just information being dumped on you. And so you need to intellectually figure that out and think that through. Zacchaeus was no different. He wanted to know who is this Jesus that is coming by. But there is a problem in his reason for coming in the way he did and climbing up in the sycamore tree is because he had an unchangeable obstruction. He was little in stature. So he's standing in the crowd and everybody's bigger and taller than what he is. He can't see what is going on. So he climbs up into a sycamore tree to be able to catch a glimpse of who Jesus Christ is. Now, there's often obstacles that come in our life that block us from really getting to know who Christ is. And uh, you gotta deal with those obstacles. You need to remove those optical obstacles. You need to get them out of your way so you can make a way for you to come in touch with and encounter with the eternal Son of God. And so he had a problem. He had an unchangeable obstruction because of his stature. And so I see the reason for him coming to Jesus Christ. I see also the request that's made by Jesus when Jesus sees him there. Notice in verse 5, it says, When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Uh, I'm just, it's interesting as you go through the scriptures, whenever you see somebody making an effort to meet Christ, he always identifies them and turns to them and acknowledges them. And I just know this, if you really want to know who God is, I just know this, that God will meet with you and speak to you in a special way. And so the request made by Jesus was directed to the individual. He says, Zacchaeus. There's a crowd around him. The disciples are with him. There's multitudes that are there. And here's this one man, small stature, climbed up into a tree to be able to get a glimpse, to be able to try to comprehend who Jesus Christ is. And in the midst of all that is taking place, Jesus Christ 
calls out one person, Zacchaeus. Now, I'm thankful that the Lord, through all that is going on in the world and all the stuff that we have to deal with, I'm thankful that God is interested in me personally. I'm thankful he's interested in you. But I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm more than thankful that he's interested in me. And so you say, well, that's awful selfish. No, I just want the Lord to direct his attention to me. I want the light of Christ to shine upon me. And he'll speak the same thing to you. He'll meet with you the same way. And knowing this, that Jesus is, is aware of who you are, where you are, and what your struggles are in life. He knew who Zacchaeus was. He knew what the struggles was he was dealing with. He knew the desire of his heart. And so he directed his conversation towards an individual, Zacchaeus, just like when he was at the tomb of Lazarus. And uh, we have to raise Lazarus out of the grave. He just didn't say, arise, get up out of the grave. He said, Lazarus, come forth. Why? Because God is in, interested in the individual. That's why Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. God's in, interested in the individual. And your life and who you are is important to God. So he directed it to the individual. I see another request that Jesus made was that he desired an immediate uh, answer. He says here in verse 5, when he came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, notice he said, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And so he wanted an immediate answer. Zacchaeus, get get it in gear. Let's get going. I always get tickled uh, Sunday morning, uh, not Sunday morning, uh, weekday mornings, I always greet the kids when they're coming in uh, for school, when they're dropped off. Uh, this one little boy, I tell you, he comes up here, he, here he's coming. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's all the way out of the parking lot. <laughs> I'm like, this is going to take a while. <laughs> and he comes in. There's another one. I always I tell him, Mrs. Moulton. I said, boy, he's in high gear today because here he comes. <laughs> that is the speed that he was running. That's it. You don't have to get any more out of there. Jesus is telling Zacchaeus, don't drag your feet. Make haste. Amen. Uh, you have climbed up in the tree to find me and speak with me and see me. Now, uh, let's, let's get it on. Amen. Uh, years ago, I went to a person's house to lead them to the Lord. And they had come out to church a few times, he and his wife. And I went over there and just trying to be pastorally, you know, sitting there talking, making conversation. And uh, they were sitting at their dining room table. They had their Bibles on the table. And that's what was going there to go over and teach them the word of God. And I got there and I'm making just social conversation. And finally the husband looked at me and said, Pastor, you came here to teach us the Bible, didn't it? I said, well, yeah. He said, well, let's get on with it. <laughs> I said, all right. So we went through the word of God and they both got saved that night. But uh, what am I saying? Sometimes you just need to put it in gear, folks. Uh, we need to make haste. And he said today, you know, today is the day of salvation. If you're with us, you're watching live stream. You're not saved. I want you to know this. The day is the day of salvation. Let's make haste and get unto the Lord. And so he desired an immediate response, immediate answer from Zacchaeus. And then I see this, that there was a determination that Jesus gave could have been rejected. He said, uh, for today I must abide at thy house. And at that point, Zacchaeus has to make a decision. Either he has to decide that he's going to immediately respond to what Christ has spoken to him, or he's going to reject it. But it tells us in verse 6, he made haste and came down and received him with joyfully. And so uh, it's, it's your decision. Jesus is willing to look at you and respond to you and reveal to you who he is. But once he gives the invitation and makes the request, you got to make the decision. You have to determine, are you going to receive him or are you going to reject him? John 1 12 says as many as received him to them gave you the power to become the sons of God 
even to them that believe on his name. And so we see this matter of a request made by Jesus. I see in verse 8, as we read through the text, repentance that is exercised for sin. Notice in verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore it restore him fourfold. Notice he had a desire to do good. Now, I don't know whether Zacchaeus at this moment uh, was wanting to work his way to heaven to get forgiveness of God, but it seems as Jesus is coming to be at his house and be, reveal to him who he is, right away he thinks in his mind, he has the concept, I need to do good. I have a desire to do good. And the reality is there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. And so uh, he needs to acknowledge who Christ is, and Jesus is going to reveal that to him in a moment. So there's a desire to do good, and there's a demonstration of a wrong that needed to be made right. Because he says, if I've uh, taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And so I, I just know this, when the Lord speaks, then we have to respond uh, in faith, believing that he'll forgive us and deliver us. Why? Because there's reconciliation made to Zacchaeus by the Son of God. Notice in verse 9, Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation to come to this house, for so much as he also is the son of Abraham. And so Jesus responds to Nicodemus's conversation with him and acknowledges that this day salvation has come to you because Christ is there, not because of his works or his desire to do what's right or to try to do what is good, but the fact that the Son of God is there in his presence. These nine verses, verses one through nine, are all an introduction and a preparation to understand why verse 10 is so significant. Because you can just read verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we know that, we believe that, we tell people that. But when you think about the condition of people's lives, that's what verse 1 through 9 is. Amen. It's revealing to us the condition of Zacchaeus. It's revealing to us his thought process. It's revealing to us his desires that he has. And as we read through that, we see this that is uh, Zacchaeus is experiencing. Now we understand why it's so important for verse 10, because the Son of Man has come for what? To deliver and to save Zacchaeus. Amen. And that's why he has come in this world to deliver and to save each one of us. So let's think about this matter of seeking souls. And first of all, realize that there is a call to be saved. And uh, we are, when we are called to be saved, we are delivered from the enemy. There is a great enemy uh, that is against us. And uh, he, listen, the devil always fights against whatever God does. And in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, in reference to John the Baptist uh, being born, and what he would do in Luke chapter 1, verse 4, 71, it says and that we should be saved. This is uh, Zechariah responding to the people in reference to the birth of John the Baptist. He says that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all that hate us. And so really John the Baptist was a forerunner of Christ. He came into this world for that distinct purpose to be able to pro prepare people's hearts to receive the Messiah that was coming for one reason, that they might be saved. And so we see we're delivered from the enemy. There's Satan we are delivered from. And uh, uh, we know in Luke chapter 8 in the parable of the sower, it tells us that the seed, uh, the devil comes and snatches the seed away that is planted. And we have a great enemy of our soul and that's Satan himself. I mean, if you think of this, if Satan would come into the Garden of Eden and tempt Adam and Eve, who were placed in a perfect environment, 
and be able to entice them to disbelieve God, how much more can he trip up us? And so we have a great enemy, it's the devil. In Romans chapter uh, 7, in verse 18, uh, we have the enemy of the flesh. Notice, in, I'll read it for you. Paul says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And so we have the devil who is always fighting against us. He is our arch enemy. And uh, he's going to do whatever he can to, to keep you blinded from the gospel. Our flesh enjoys everything that is lustful and wicked that is in this world. And our flesh will do whatever it can to keep us from coming to Christ. And then there's the world in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Zacchaeus had a problem. He was rich. Uh, he was crooked. Uh, he was disliked. He was a publican. And so he was living his life completely consumed by the influence of Satan, the flesh, and the world. And he hears Jesus is coming. And he said, I, I, I got to go see this, Jesus. I, 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 need, I need to go see who he is. What is it that he's presenting? What is it that he's doing to make a difference in people's lives? I can't see him because of the crowd when I'm climbing up into the sycamore tree because I've got to know because my life is in shambles even though I have wealth abundant and everything else. My life is in shambles. And Jesus Christ says, Come down out of the sycamore tree because I have to make come to your house today right. because salvation has come to your house today. Yeah. Why? Because Jesus Christ was there. And so we find we can have delivery from the enemy. Uh, we receive this deliverance by faith and by faith alone. For by grace are you saved through faith. Amen. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we need to receive this forgiveness that God has for us by simply by faith. Zacchaeus was like, what, what do I have to do? I'll give, I'll give all this money back to people that I've taken advantage of. I'll pay back fourfold. If I've uh, cheated somebody, uh, no, Zacchaeus, you need to have faith. You need to have salvation that is free. Why? Because it's completely fulfilled in Christ and Christ alone. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven uh, among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Romans 10, 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so we see this matter of the call to be saved, the Zacchaeus, is based on the fact that he needed to be delivered from his enemy. He would be delivered by faith and faith alone that is in Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about seeking souls, that's what we need to tell people. That, that's what people need to hear. They need to know that. They need to be able to understand that. So they're called to be saved. Then we have the confidence of the saved. And we have to think of this, that salvation is equal for all. Acts chapter 15 is a great chapter you can study sometime. In that chapter, we have the first church council that was ever called. The problem was, as uh, Gentiles were being saved, the Jewish believers felt that the Gentiles had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And as a result of that, the church council is called together. Peter calls the church council together. And as Paul and, and Silas and Peter and James, and they're all there, they gather together and they meet to determine how is a person saved. They're not saved by com completing and holding on to the law of the Old Testament. They're not saved and, and completed by doing work, good works in the present. They come to the conclusion that by the grace of God, we are all equally saved and delivered. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 11 is the summary of the conclusion 
of, of how a person is saved. So salvation is equal for all. You're, you, you're not going to be able to get to heaven quicker than somebody else because maybe you have money. You're not going to be able to get to heaven quicker than somebody else because you, the fact that you're in church more than everybody else. We, when we're all on a level, even playing ground, so to speak. We all have to have a personal faith in Christ and Christ alone. And the Christ who saves me saves you the exact same way. And so Zacchaeus need to have confidence that salvation was for all. That included him. He was a son of Abraham. Amen. But he needed to have Christ as his Savior. And then salvation removes us from the wrath of God. And I'm thankful to be saved tonight. And I'm thankful that we can tell other people how to be saved. Uh, because of the fact it delivers us from the wrath of God. Without Christ, all we have to look forward to is the judgment of God. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then in verse 9 says this, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And so knowing this, that Jesus Christ removes us from the wrath of God. I surrendered to preach years ago because of the fact that I was raised in a Baptist church that did not tell me how to be saved. Uh, they baptized me when I was 13 by immersion to become a member of the church. They did not tell me how to be saved. And then I got saved, and my first question in my mind was, I was in church every Sunday. Why wouldn't somebody tell me how to be saved? That just didn't make any sense to me. And then I was listening to Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, Saved a Wretch Like Me. And as I was listening to that song, all I could see was all my friends that I went to church with all my life being thrown into hell because they were not saved. They, were, they, they experienced the same thing I experienced. And I, and I thought of this, salvation, God has delivered me. He saved me. And he gave me new life. And when he did that, he removed me from his wrath because the wrath that judges my sin was all put on Jesus Christ. And so salvation removes us from the God's wrath. And so we're not looking for God's wrath. We're looking to be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation can be experienced by loved ones. In other words, Paul said, brethren, my heart's desire for Israel is that they might be saved. Uh, his complete desire was that, that the, his people, Israel, would come to know Christ as their Savior. And so uh, your family, your friends, your loved ones can be saved just like you got saved. Yeah. The, the problem is we have a tendency because when we witness the friends and loved ones, they have a, a less willingness to listen to us. Amen. And uh, the reality is this, that uh, 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 they still need to be saved. And if you'll pray for them and you'll love them and you'll tell them who Christ is, as Jesus revealed himself to Zacchaeus, uh, they'll come to know Christ as their Savior. And it may take you many, many years. It took my wife, my, my mother, 28 years she prayed for my dad to be saved. And he got, got saved. And my, my grandmother, as soon as we got saved, we tried witnessing to my grandfather and my grandmother. My grandmother didn't want to hear anything about it. My grandfather uh, had already passed away. And so I don't know if he ever heard the gospel or not. But my grandmother, when she was, uh, I think she was 91 or 92 years old, uh, after surgery, she was staying at my mom and dad's house, and my dad was able to lead my grandma to the Lord. Amen. So you don't give up on somebody. You don't. You don't just start saying, "Well, they'll never get saved." You don't know that. And if God's not willing that any should perish, and He'd save you, then He'll use you to be an influence and a help with somebody else to know who this Jesus Christ is. And so salvation can be experienced. Uh, by your loved ones. So we're called to be saved. We have confidence of the saved. And then we have the conflict of the saved. Uh, first of all, realize this. We have a message to share, 
But our message oftentimes is considered foolishness. In uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul helps us understand that. He says, for the preaching of the cross to them that perish, uh, I'm sorry, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it's the power of God. I've had people over the years, I've tried to talk to them about Christ, and they're telling me, oh, that, that's just foolishness. I don't want to hear anything about that. I've had people come to church, and they hear me preach, and I've had them leave, and they say, well, I ain't never coming back to this place. You're crazy. <laughs> and uh, the, the message you're sharing, it, listen, the message that we share is good news. To somebody that does not know Christ as their Savior, they may consider the message as being foolish. But the reality is, it's the message of Christ that made a difference in your life. Amen. And it's the message of Christ that will make a difference in other people's lives. So realize our message often is considered foolish. Our message is often obscured by others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 1 through 3 or 4, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us, about this matter of what the gospel is. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declared unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you had believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he begins to explain how many people witness, were eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ rising out of the grave. Oftentimes, when we try to tell people about the gospel, they want to get us off track. And uh, I, I don't know how many times I've witnessed some people and they uh, say, well, well, what about this? What does the Bible say about this? Well, you know, I heard a preacher say this about it, and I, I just tell them, let's keep the main thing the main thing. You know, because we can, we can debate about all the issues in life. And, but if you're not saved, it's not going to make any difference to you. Amen. So let's keep the th main thing the main thing. There's a time to deal with issues in life, but when you're talking about seeking souls, you need to focus on the gospel message of Jesus Christ and help them to understand that no matter what is going on in the world, the gospel has not changed. Jesus Christ died and was buried and he rose again, and you need to trust this resurrected Savior uh, uh, as and believe on him in order to be saved. And then I see this, the last thought is this. Our message is opposed by the unsaved. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I've been reading some articles about different countries around the world that are starting to make it uh, against the law to evangelize. Right. Uh, you know, here in America, our basic freedom that we have is to be able to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, we have to be careful about this thing because the unsaved wants to fight against us making people aware of the fact that God is real and God loves them and Jesus Christ came in this world to save them and their only hope of eternal life is by receiving Christ as their Savior. People despise that message. And they oppose it. First Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 12 says that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God which are in Judea after in, um, are in Christ. For ye also have suffered like things in your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, 
and they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. The conflict of the saved is very clear that there is opposition to us sharing our faith with others. Now, the amazing thing is, is the Pharisees were in a turmoil because of Zacchaeus talking to Jesus. The fact that Jesus went into the home of a sinner. And it would be well for us to remember that God has called us to go into the homes and into the office places, into the social areas of the world in which we live to talk to people that are not sure they're going to heaven to help them to understand who Jesus Christ is. And so we seek souls with Jesus Christ. All this had happened in Zacchaeus' life all comes to a summary of the fact, the bottom line, uh, oh, uh, Paul Harvey used to always say, here's the rest of the story. The bottom line is the rest of the story is just simply this, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And so we just need to get connected with that. If you're watching live stream, you're not sure you're saved, you need to contact us. We'd love to show you how to be saved. If you're here tonight and you're not sure you're saved, you need to be saved tonight. Jesus Christ came to this world for you. God loves you specifically. As he called Zacchaeus, he'll call your name now and call you a salvation, seeking the lost. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the reality that Jesus Christ calls us to salvation. I'm thankful for this interaction, this conversation that Zacchaeus had with Jesus. It reveals so much of what was on his heart and what was the desire of the Lord. And so, Lord, help us to connect with that. Help us to be able to share that with others. And God, I pray that uh, uh, just that the salvation of the Lord would come upon so many people who have no hope right now. God bless us. Help us to be tender-hearted, compassionate enough to speak up and show people who Jesus Christ is. I pray that you bless in this invitation, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation. While we're singing, if you're not sure you're saved, we'd love to show you from the Bible how to be saved. I'll be standing down front. You can come down and we'll take the Bible and show you how to believe on Christ. Uh, you may be a Christian. You say, well, I just need to talk to some people about the Lord, some people God laid on my heart. Why don't you come and pray for them tonight and ask God to give you the opportunity to show them who Christ is. Amen. Let's sing it out. You come and talk. You have longed for sweet
for just a wonderful day today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the message tonight, Lord. Lord, your heart, Lord, is to see souls saved. Your desire is to see others, those who are lost, to come to you. And Lord, may that be our heart. May that fire burn in our souls. Lord, that we would desire to see others come to you. And Lord, there was a time in each of our lives that someone cared enough to share the gospel with us. And Lord, may that burden, that passion be stirred in our hearts to tell others about you. Lord, the only thing that's going to change this world is Jesus Christ. And so help us, Lord, to share the glorious good news. And Lord, what a great time as we get ready to celebrate Resurrection Sunday to tell others about a glorious Savior who lives today. Lord, thank you for what you've done this morning, this afternoon, this evening in each of our lives. And I pray, Lord, that we would leave here with a burning passion to see others come to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all for being here.